Hello, I am that British guy and welcome to my review of all of the free games for PlayStation Plus for the month of July. I just want to start off by apologising really for the lateness of this video. As some of you may be aware, I am in the middle of a move and it's really pushed this one back. I appreciate that we're right at the end of the month now, so this might not be particularly beneficial for many people it might be best if you just sort of download all the games and try them for yourselves but I'm going to go through them anyway and I promise from the month of August I'm aiming to have this video out within the first week of each month just so that you can sort of have a look at it so that then you've got plenty of time to get hold of any of the games that I'm suggesting you either buy yourself or try out. Just like last month, I'm going to go through each game in turn, uh, give you a basic overview of sort of the premise and what you do, an idea of the visuals and the sound of the game, what the controls are like, and then just my overall thoughts. And then at the very end of the video, just run through each one in turn as to whether I think you should buy it for its retail value anyway. Try it out while it's free, and I appreciate at the moment that doesn't give you a lot of time, or whether you should fly on this game and just leave it and, and don't even bother touching it. So let's start off with the PS4 games and start with Until Dawn. Now the idea of this game is you control a group of eight friends who are up on top of a mountain lodge. And it's all sort of creepy, scary, almost sort of horror film-esque. And the idea is that you've got to try and keep them all safe until dawn. There's something out on the mountain and you've got to protect them from that. Also, between each section of the game that is split up into chapters, um, there's also moments where you're in a psychiatrist's office and he tries to learn about your personality and fears. And I think this will actually impact on what sort of happens throughout the game. I've only played it all the way through once, so I'm not entirely sure in terms of how that would affect future playthroughs, but it does seem to influence some of the things that are happening, certainly in his office, so I would presume this plays into the main game. Talking of game, he actually uses the word game a lot, which is quite obviously unusual within a game. It kind of throws the realism off kilter a bit, which is quite clever, sort of messes with your head a bit, which is... it's very interesting. In terms of the overall visuals and the sound, obviously because of the tones of the game, it's very dark, very gloomy. What they've managed to do is use lighting very, very well and shadows in order to sort of heighten the tension and every now and then you get camera angles from an onlooker's perspective which sort of adds to the creepiness, almost as if you're the person looking through the bushes at this group of people. In terms of the sound effects, they really add to the mood, just like the lighting and the shadowing. And the fact that as soon as the game starts proper, the opening song plays, which is called Oh Death, sort of sets the tone for the overall game. And music actually has a strong presence throughout and is almost like an extra character just sort of lurking in the background, really helps to add to the tension and the overall tone of the game. In terms of the controls, it is mainly just walking around and interacting with objects. Sometimes this is timed, which sort of puts you in a heightened panic state, and sometimes you have very ambiguous choices to make and it's not entirely clear what the outcome of either one would be until you try it and you don't really get much thinking time, which obviously in that situation you wouldn't do, which is quite clever. But it isn't totally on rails, it's not moving from room to room and you just press a few buttons here and there. You are actually able to explore little areas at a time and find other objects and things like that. So you are actually sort of more involved and invested in the game and the characters. Overall, by the time I got to the end, I was really, really invested in all the characters and really wanted everyone to escape safely at the end there are butterfly effect moments throughout the game as well depending on choices that you make and although they might have a little bit of an impact right there and then they sort of follow through and splinter into other choices later throughout the game so obviously repeat playthroughs you're able to experience quite a few different scenarios every single time you play it can be very very different added to that there's quite a few bits and pieces to find out about 
past events that happened there not only a year ago which all the characters are quite closely connected to because of a pair of sisters but also something that happened about 60 years ago as well which sort of set the wheels in motion for everything else it's really clever how you peel back layers and find out about everything and how it then all interweaves right at the end of the game works really really well Moving on, we have the Game of Thrones Telltale series for PlayStation 4. And I'm going to, straight off the bat, I have never watched Game of Thrones. I realise I'm probably one of about four people in the entire world that hasn't watched it. And I've also not read any of the books either. So I've got no idea in terms of the internal politics of all the different houses or anything like that. This game starts off following people in the House Forester, and I'm assuming that's how sort of the beginning of the first series starts and how the books sort of begin, but obviously I'm not completely sure on that. As you would expect from a Telltale game, it's very, very heavy quick time events, mainly based on conversations that, quote, change how the story is told, but obviously as this is a Telltale game, there's only so much change sometimes, a person might not give you an item or they might say something mean to you once because you've annoyed them in a previous conversation. From my previous experience of playing other Telltale games, it doesn't really change the story that much, to be honest. And I'm presuming that's the case with this. In terms of the visual and sound, the whole thing looks really, really nicely presented. It looks like an oil painting throughout. This sort of shows that they didn't try and go hell for leather with the sort of realism which I'm hoping meant that they just didn't spend far too many man hours on. It's still visually stunning in a really, really artistic way, and I'm presuming less demanding on from the graphical side of things. The sound, as you expect in sort of some of the action scenes, heightens those moments, and I'm presuming that sort of follows what happens in terms of tense moments in the TV series or the battles and things like that which obviously it can draw on quite well from a, a starting point, which is very, very helpful. In terms of the controls, it's, it's basically just on-screen prompts all the time, using the face buttons. Again, there's there's some of those moments where you've got to input um, a sequence of buttons within a set time, and no one ever manages to get those first time out, because you've almost got to memorise the pattern before you can even do it. So it keeps going around in a circle until you're able to input controls. It's not really a, a good way of, of keeping you invested in the game, because you don't really care about what's going on, you just want to move on to the next bit. To be honest, it would be easier if it just played out in front of you, and really, in terms of that, I'm not entirely sure who this game was aimed at. If you've seen the TV series or if you've read the books, I don't really see why you would need to play this game because you already are aware of all of it. And to be honest, you are more watching than playing. There's just a few button prompts to talk to certain people at certain points. But in playing the game, it doesn't really make me want to watch the series or read any of the books. I suppose some diehard fans might want to experience Game of Thrones in every single possible form, so they would be interested in the game, but I can't see what they would get out of this that they haven't got from experiencing it in other means. Moving on to the next game is Don't Die Mr. Robot. Now this is available for PS4 and PS Vita and I play this on the Vita. Very, very basic premise. You control Mr. Robot who is just basically a square in the middle of the screen and the idea is that you have to avoid other things that come onto screen and collect as much fruit as you can. If you are able to collect the fruit while there are other enemies in the vicinity of that fruit, it will kind of send out an energy pulse and blow those up, giving you points. And it's basically just to try and move around and avoid getting hit whilst collecting the fruit to blow up the enemies and get as many points as you can. The visuals and the sound, um, it, it looks pretty nice. It's really cartoony, sort of what you would expect from a, a little handheld game. The sound and the music, I guess, was okay, but there's, there's nothing really too memorable there to write home about, just sort of in the background. And in terms of the controls, it's very basic. It's just moving the analog stick around just to avoid things and collect the power-ups, really. 
Overall, it's it's a nice little distraction, to be honest. There's not a hell of a lot to the game, but it's quite a nice, easy one to pick up for a, a little while on the Vita. I'm not really sure why you would probably play it on the PS4, but I suppose if you don't have a Vita, it might be nice for just a quick distraction. And other than that, it's quite a cheap game anyway, so you, you can't really go wrong. It's only a, a couple of quid, so can't hurt really. Moving on to the other game for the PS Vita, Elemental. Now, the idea of this is you control, well, what starts off as a sort of an air blob at the beginning, and you're able to use the face buttons or the analog stick to change the state from air to ice to stone to a fireball, and they all do slightly different things. Now, if you hit the environment around you as an air bubble or as a fireball you will blow up and you'll have to sort of go back a little bit and move through the level again and the idea is basically to get to an end point and every now and then they'll put different obstacles in your path and you need to work out how to get past those areas by changing state to get through to the next section to be honest it was just annoying really trying to get through these puzzles that some of them were just more awkward than they needed to be and couple that really with the the visuals of it is just a very brown and grayish sort of color palette so it looked very dull wasn't very enticing whether that changes as you progress through the game or not i don't know and again, like Don't Die Mr. Robot, the sound was just sort of there. Didn't really do anything for me, to be honest. Overall, I just the, the puzzles were just really frustrating and awkward. And because you kept blowing up all the time and going back, it just made the whole thing really, really grind to a halt. Rather than if you chose the wrong state and you couldn't quite get past the obstacle, instead of blowing you up, if it just meant that you had to sort of go back a bit and have a run up at it again wouldn't have been too bad but it just kept putting you back and putting you back all the time and it just really wound me up to be honest and it just sort of took the fun away at a really early stage of the game and just made it a slog next up we have the ps3 games firstly we have tokyo jungle now the idea behind this is humans have left the earth for some undisclosed reason and basically all of the animals have taken over, all the pets have gone feral and all the animals from zoos and places have escaped and the whole thing is a wild land. And you are in the middle of Tokyo that has sort of over time become this jungle. And what you do is you start off as a creature of choice, although at the beginning there's not a lot of choice. And you have to sort of survive in that environment, really. You have to feed and hunt and breed in order to keep your family lineage alive throughout the years. The visuals of the game, to be honest, it looks really, really clever what they've done. It's clearly still sort of streets of Tokyo. And the animals look really good and and pretty realistic, to be honest, considering this is still only a, a PS3 game. But everything within the city looks quite wild and and unkempt it's quite nice look to it but you can clearly see that this was a human city beforehand it's sort of in the middle of the two at the moment the sound there's there's a few sort of sound prompts that are quite handy for if you're being hunted or if you've been spotted while you're hunting the overall sound of the game again like quite a few of the games this month has been quite forgettable to be honest but some of the sound effects are quite useful from a gameplay point of view in terms of the controls after a fairly lengthy introduction to get used to all the different game modes like hunting and and sneaking around and breeding and everything like that you are thrown into the game but i can see why they put that in at the beginning because there's quite a few different things that you have to do very specifically at different times so without that knowledge you would just die within seconds so it was a bit of a slog to begin with to get through that but once you did and you knew what you were doing was quite nice to sort of then get into it and most of the time it's just sort of moving around and um, knowing what face buttons to push at the right time but obviously it's knowing what the action and the consequence of those are at certain times that the introduction actually teaches you overall i'm not really sure if the game knew overall i'm not sure if the game really knew what it wanted to be it was quite fun to start with 
But I never managed to unlock any of the other animals, which limited what I could do, and a lot of them were locked behind a paywall, which was annoying. Granted, they were only, I think, about 39p, but when you're having to pay for a couple of dozen characters extra that you can't unlock in any other way, it just feels a bit like a cash grab, to be honest. It seemed to me, in terms of the character unlocking, that there were certain challenges you had to complete as one of the characters in order to earn the right to unlock other characters. But the game never really made that particularly clear. So I'd collected all these points and wasn't able to spend them on anything because I hadn't earned the right to unlock any of these other characters. So I was stuck playing the same two characters all the way through and it got pretty boring quite quickly, to be honest. And finally, we move on to Darkstalker's Resurrection. Now, this is just a basic beat-em-up fighter, really. It plays very much like Street Fighter, and a lot of the characters feel like reskins from that game. Their movesets look very, very similar, and you could kind of see with quite a lot of them who they had based those characters on. The visuals, it had a very very colourful cartoony look. The characters look very diverse and they play in their own distinctive way. The locations as well visually and musically fit the characters in the same sort of way that they do in Street Fighter. And after each fight there's a bit of voice work but it's, it's very limited and very basic. Just sort of victory speeches really. In terms of the controls, it's very easy for it to be a button masher. There are quite a few combos and special moves, but I could never really got, get the hang of them. There's a training mode that shows you how to link certain button prompts together in order to create combos, but the speed with which you have to input them, you almost have to know what the sequence is in order to be able to complete the move. Even if you're a fraction of a second slower than what the screen is telling you to do, you have to start the whole sequence again from the beginning. So you can never properly learn it because you already have to know it in order to complete it. Really, really odd way of teaching you special moves and combos. Overall, yeah, why not just play Street Fighter, really? Because that's clearly what this game is trying to be with all the reskins and everything. And some of the characters are just blatant rip-offs of people like Chun-Li and Vega and Blanca they're moving exactly the same way and a lot of the moves are even clearly the same moves so finally we move on to buy try or fly here is a list of the games in full with the price of how much they would normally cost you in PlayStation Store so starting off with Until Dawn, I would definitely suggest you buy this game, even at $29.99. It's got a hell of a lot of longevity to it with repeat plays because of the butterfly effect and collecting different items to find out what's going on. Yes, a lot of the time you are just walking around picking up objects, but it really draws you in right from the beginning. It's really, really fun to play. Next up, we have Game of Thrones. And to be honest, for diehard fans, I suppose they might want to try it just to see how different it is from other mediums of the game. But generally speaking, I would say fly. There's not really anything to be gained from this. You might as well just watch the TV series because you're just watching the game anyway. Don't die, Mr. Robot. I would suggest you buy this game. It's quite a nice little fun distraction. It's only $2.89 anyway, so it's nice and cheap. And especially if you've got a PS Vita, it's just a, a fun little game to lose yourself in for a little while. However, on the flip side, Elemental, it just annoyed me too much. It was far too fiddly. I couldn't get into it. It just was not nice to play. You might want to try it if you've got a Vita because it's only 6 49 anyway. But yeah, maybe it was just me, to be honest. But it just sort of killed things for me at an early stage and I never really got into it. Tokyo Jungle, I can see this appealing to certain people. I really wanted to like it when I first started playing it. I thought, oh, this could be fun. But when I couldn't unlock different characters, it just became very repetitive very quickly. Maybe that was just me missing something key to being able to earn the right to unlock certain characters. I'll probably go back to this uh, next month and just see if... It was me, so that I can really give it a fair hearing. That was the only thing really letting it down, was just the repetitiveness of only being able to be two characters, unfortunately. And finally, we have Darkstalker's Resurrection. Easy. Fly. Don't bother. Just play Street Fighter. 
or Mortal Kombat or any other fighter really, but especially because this one was clearly trying to be Street Fighter, you might as well just play one of those. To be honest, I'd rather have just played Street Fighter 2 on my snares. And there we go. That was what I thought of all of the free PlayStation Plus games for the month of July. If you've played any of these games yourself, please let me know what you think of them in the comments below. Please give the video a thumbs up if you like it and subscribe to the channel. You can find me on Facebook and also follow me on Twitter at RightlyWrongly. I have been That British Guy and I will see you very soon. Goodbye.